Bill Hurd from Hackaday. Today we're going to finish up the little CPLD board we started. If you remember, it was too wide to fit on a freaking solderless breadboard. So we fixed that and we ended up with something actually kind of cute. Just to recap, this is Rev2 of a CPLD module I started with, a, a complex programmable logic device. Um, and, and it was something that you could build yourself. I meant this as a DIY kit. I've actually been having some fun and, you know, possibly even replace an obsolete chip someday, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's almost all through holes, so you can stuff it yourself. And uh, we try and improve on the last design. And, and so some of the things we improved on. One, the last one was too wide to fit in a solderless breadboard. Mostly, I don't use solderless breadboards, didn't know how wide they were. Uh, second was it didn't have any dedicated power connections and so I was clipping to the bottom to the pins that actually would fit into a, you know, your PC board or whatnot or into your breadboard and the clips kept coming off so it's got a dedicated power connector and there's an external clock capability via jumper and that was uh, somebody suggested that from the comments it was a great great suggestion so you can just bring in an external clock and uh, the other stuff was cleaning up the schematic so it was easier to troubleshoot. Let me show you this side by side with the old one and uh, show you what it's capable of here. Here's the original uh, CPLD module, the Rev1. And as I said, it was too wide to fit in a solderless breadboard. See, you only get one row. And I thought there were various sizes of these. Turns out these are all the same width, even on the big ones where they, they have row after row. Doesn't fit. Here's the second one, and you can see it's been put on kind of a diet here, uh, most notably from the bottom. You can see it's now 0.6, which is pretty standard. One inch uh, was not standard, and uh, it, like I said, it actually looks kind of cute. L let me show you a close-up of this. Here's the Rev2 kind of close-up. You, you see that it is indeed much skinnier, 0.6 inch uh, uh, centers, and um, eh. Kind of, kind of all fits in there nice and tight. Uh, though I did use through hole for everything. The uh, oscillator here is a uh, surface mount, just mostly because otherwise it'd be huge. I used a USB micro, um, I'm sorry, USB mini uh, power plug. So this is a five volt version, uh, and and I probably if I'm going to rev this for my own purposes, and I'm going to put a different plug on there so I can use three and five volts. I was thinking strictly of the five volt version. So and with the oscillator, I can pin pin uh, I can jumper select whether I want internal oscillator or an external oscillator via this plug. And uh, on the Rev3, I'm kind of working on for my own. I just turned that into one plug. There was no reason to have two. And then there was an external power plug uh, for two wires here. And the one thing I would do different is whenever there's an, a, uh, a non-polarized plug for power, I like to put a protection diode in there. So if you get it backwards, you don't ruin everything. And that's going into my own personal Rev3 is, is that little protection diode. And, and in fact, for power, I, I'm going to use one, this little thing where I can bring it 5 volt or 3 volt. Uh, but this is kind of a custom cable I had made, so that's why this ended up with a USB micro on it. Now, the parts availability on this, um, I'm going to show you a couple of the parts. But this part here, the, the, uh, this is the 5 volt EPM 7064, the bigger of the two that fit this. This fits a 32 macro cell or a 64 macro cell. Um, this is like 8 or $9 on DigiKey in almost every catalog place. I'm, I found some overseas for about three bucks, so I ordered a bunch of them. So if somebody really wants to follow through with this, uh, get in touch with me and uh, maybe I can uh, pass some of those on. And there's also another part that's just not worth paying for. These are the pins that go here. And I'm going to actually show you how, how this works, where this can overlap that, because you actually see that it does. This strip will cost you two bucks. This is 40 pins, so you break it in half to get your, your 40 pin 220s. Uh, I got a bunch of these off of Amazon, of all places, for cheap. So again, if somebody's following through, I'm going to try and kit these up with some affordable parts. Um, mainly what you trade uh, for is just buying a little bit of bulk. I, I spent 10 bucks for a pile of these in the delivery time from overseas for the part like this. Now, the reason this didn't start, start skidding to begin with, because uh, on the old one, you see that the uh, PLD fits entirely inside these rows of, of the bottom connectors is here they actually overlap, okay? And so I, I just tack soldered these in, but um, you can see it runs right down the middle of the row. And so after you solder them, see I've clipped them. After, after you solder these in, then you gotta clip them down low 
so that a socket can fit in on top. Now, the reason I don't... See, it actually fits. Whoops. See, it actually fits. Now, I just didn't think to do that originally because I used to design for production, and this is all what we call handwork, post-solder assembly work, just cringe-worthy work. Never be able to produce this mass quantities, but hey, it's just us having some fun, right? So uh, that's kind of the trick where we were able to, and, and it worked also for the in-circuit programmer plug, uh, ran it right down the middle. It's just there's parts on both sides of the board inter-soldered, but you know what? There was parts on both sides of the board anyways. Before we jump into the project level, and again, my goal was to give you a project that you can actually just open up and start right in. All the pieces are there, including a timing simulation, etc. Uh, I wanted to show what a CPLD or a PLD actually, what's on the inside. And you'll see it's a programmable logic device. Well, the programmable part, it's all over the place, but the main part of it are these macro cells, or they call them LABs in the Altera parlance. It means logic array block. And there's a, repeat, a repeated chunk of logic, and we'll see that logic here in a second. Uh, in, in the case of a 7064, there's 64 of them. Uh, then we've got programmable I.O. controls, so the pins can be programmed as inputs, outputs, the SLU control, that kind of thing. And we've got some global signals, like global clocks, which go to everything very low skew between all the blocks. Uh, you, you don't ripple it from one block to another. It's, it's a mesh of global clocks, a couple to choose from, some output enables, and then a global clear. So inside the LABs, it's, it's got the ability to pick off all kinds of different signals. Actually, this is on the edge of the LAB. And then it just goes into a product term, and you don't hook up AND gates and whatnot. You create a formula that, that, that blows these bits in here. So it says, well, give me three of those, two of those, one of those, invert that one, feed it back. And so uh, this is really what's going on. It's just it, it's it's a matrix array of logic. It's and and so it does all the logic in one step instead of rippling through AND gates and OR gates. This on the right hand side is how we program the I/O. Again, this gets really handy in FPGAs where you can do uh, LVDT and and high speed uh, different you know 2.5 TT or 2.5 volt CMOS. You know you you program all that in here. Um, so this is what's in a CPLD is basically an array of these things that are programmable um, over and over again. And here's the hackaday.io project page for this that I'm setting up. And there will be all the files and links here for you to either edit the schematic yourself if you use Proteus like I do. Or the Gerber files will be there, including I'll make sure that there is a zipped file set up for Oshpark if you use Oshpark. Um, it's got all the naming conventions already corrected in it and everything. Uh, I myself had just started using a company called PCB Way, and I got like 50 of these uh, boards made for like $22 or something like that and delivered in a week. So I'm kind of <laughs> happy about that right now. I'm starting to design all kinds of things. So, uh, but in here will be, like I said, the Gerbers and, and some of the things, but the main thing will be uh, the uh, Altera project file and I'll make sure the link to the version of Altera Quartus you need is there. So let's go ahead and assume you've gone to Quartus, you've downloaded it, and you're ready to open the project file. Let me show you what that looks like. So to get into this, you would do a file open project and the project file that's from the hackaday.io page. And uh, from here, we can select hierarchy files. Files is the easiest to understand, I think, for beginners. And in there, you'll see that there's a waveform file, there is a Verilog file, .v, and there is a block diagram file, which is a graphic file, and clicking on it gives us this. Now, this is an overview of the chip. Here are the output pins. In my case, I've made several bunches of counters. Just look at all these pins. And I've got a simple clock coming in, and I've said that that's that global clock that goes everywhere with very minimal school skew so that when I'm clocking, I'm not racing myself to get to the next block. And uh, you can add graphical blocks, like I could have added a certain kind of counter as a, as a block here, and you can do it right next to blocks that you know, imply a Verilog block. And, and by the way, here's the Cordis download. Again, I'll make, I'll make sure this is uh, linked correctly, easy for you to see. Um, so if we go in here, it says, well, what, what are you trying to get to? And I said, well, I I'd like to get to uh, U1, which is the main CPLD of my design. And I want to get to block1.v.verilog. 
here I've hooked everything up for you for this uh, CPLD board that we're talking about. So I've got all the inputs outputs defined by the way and the way I do it is that means the pin 26. So when I go later and I'm hooking IO 26 I want to know what pin to assign it to. I assign it to pin 26. Uh, then we tell it whether they're inputs or outputs and you can start changing this if they're input output, outputs inputs, but it's all here for you. And then I made three things inside this. I made a prescaler just because because I started with 25 megahertz. <laughs> I'm, I'm a designer it was frequency starved as a kid, right? So I'm probably going to redo this. You know, I'll probably choose to put a four megahertz or something on here. So I didn't need to prescale with 19 bits of scalar just so you could see it. Uh, but boy, it's nice to have speed sometimes. And then I made a regular counter and then I made a gray counter. And yes, I may spell gray differently than you. Uh, a gray counter, by the way, is a counter where only one bit changes at once, and they're useful for things. First off, we used to do them in the old days back when we didn't want too many flips flopping at the same time, and we didn't want to dirty up our ground inside our chips. Well, those days are gone, but it's still an old habit. Uh, it, it, but what it's really useful for is if you have like an encoder or something that you could read any time, read it asynchronously in other words, um, and you catch it right as you're going from like uh, uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 to 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and you catch it right in the middle of that, who knows what you get, 101, 101. But if you're only ever flipping one bit at a time, so you're going from 1101 to 1110, or I'm sorry, 1101 to uh, 1111, you catch it right in the middle, and you're only ever off by one bit. So it's useful as a, uh, an asynchronous counter. So I made a gray scale counter, and I could have done this with a uh, part that's already built in. I just happened to do it with definition. So here I assign the output pins to the functions. If you're doing your own thing, you would pick the I.O. pin you want, and you would say, this is the output of my ERC generator, error, error correction, right? You could fit an error correction in here. And then here's the little bit of work uh, in this Verilog file. And always at the positive edge. I didn't put the resets, the clears, all that. Didn't have fun, you know. Uh, but what I did was I made a prescaler. Actually, I combined uh, blocking and non-blocking here, but we'll get over it. And, and if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. If you do know what it means, yes, I know I screwed up. Uh, but here, a counter is nothing more than Q equals Q plus 1. And we'll find that it implemented, actually, I'll show you here, we're in the hierarchy. It said, well, I'll put the counter in for you, one for the scale and one for the Q. And uh, I can make this, if I want to recompile this, let's say it's a counter that's counting down. Now it's counting down. The gray counter does a thing where it's exclusive orient one bit with the bit nearest it. Remember, it's always flipping one at a time, so it's, it's cognizant of its neighbors. Let's put it that way. You can find the formulas for this all over the internet, or you can sit down and work them out yourself, or knock yourself out, do something custom. So with that done, uh, we just do a file save, and I'm going to go straight to compile. Here our compile is done, and now I actually want to see this work before I program it. Remember I said I gave you everything. So I have a waveform.vwf, and in there I define the clock as an input. And then I let you see the outputs. I, I, I just made groups for them. So here's the counter, here's the gray, and then I threw in some internal nodes. You can add nodes of your own with the node finder. And the main thing here is you, you, you pick what kind of thing you're looking for. Uh, there, there's pins, which is it's not a bad place to start. Let's say we just start. But then you got to hit list, and, and the asterisk here says list everything. So it's basically, it helps you find what you're looking for. And then if we add it to this, see it already existed. Uh, list. And now I've added that to this waveform. So when I go to simulate this, I'm going to see the output, and then now I've also want to see specifically this. To create the clock, I told I right-click on uh, the, the clock waveform, I go to value, 
I can do counters, stuff like that. But what I did was a clock, and I tell it the uh, the the cycle time of the clock, and it drew this for me. So, for example, if I want to make it twice as slow, there we go. So now I'm going to do a simulation. I'll do a file save. If I don't, it'll ask me. I, I kind of do that. That way I know I've clicked the right button when I start my simulation. Yes, I want to change it because I changed. And it's doing another kind of, it's basically doing a compile of anything it's missing to get you the information. And again, this isn't a test bench, which later you can use to see if when you make a change, if it breaks something, test bench is very useful for that. And so now it's opened a second uh, waveform. Here's our first one where everything's unknown. The simulation report, uh, you can throw yourself with this. You'll, you'll try uh, writing to it and changing it. Well, this is an output of a simulation. But here it's filled in. You can see the gray six that we asked for. Let's see if we can zoom out. This is basically the operation of it. So I here you see that the timing has now been included. And this is the older timing. They stopped using it after 9.2. And they started using model sim, uh, which is more powerful, but it's got its own little quirks. This one was nice and easy built in. As a matter of fact, I changed this so it has a black background and lots of cool colors when I use this. Okay, so the final thing we'll want to do is to uh, program the device on, on the bench. Remember, I actually changed the counter to a down counter. Uh, so that looks like a little ribbon cable here, so I'm guessing that's the programmer. And here's the last time I programmed it already said, here's what I do. Okay, you get these habits of paranoia. Um, I go ahead and do an auto detect to make sure it sees my part out there. I've even thought I was programming a part and it's not out there and it doesn't know a way to tell me. All right. So here it told me it's out there. Um, then I go ahead and delete it and, and then I go ahead and I add a file. And in theory, it's talking to the same part. I'm going to do a program and a verify when it's done programming. It's highlighted, so I click start. We watch it. We hope it doesn't go bad. And it says it did it, and it didn't flag any error. So let's go see if it's counting down now. Well, it, it's counting down now. I know it's hard to see at home. It's just a bunch of blinking lights, and, but uh, that's all it started out to be, actually. So it, it was that quick uh, to, um, you know, change the sign, recompile, didn't even need to simulate, and download. So that's it for this time. It, it's uh, hopefully that gives you a starting point if you were interested in CPLDs or the educational part of playing with one. Or maybe replacing a function that it's hard to get. Do they still make 6551 yards? I don't know. Uh, I actually have my FPGA board done. Whether it works or not, it's a different matter, but I got this board cost down to less than a buck, so I'm pretty happy with that. And uh, we'll see what we can play with next time. So Bill Hurd on behalf of Hackaday, CPLD's projects all wrapped up. Go check it out, hackaday.io. Till next time, we'll see ya.